You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we've got all the best toys in Fab Facts. We're shutting up shop in the randomizer. And Jules de Young graces us with her presence for part two. That's all coming up in pod 177. Ooh, it's all got a bit scary of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Well, hello there, Richard James. Oh, hello, Jamie Anderson. How are you? Uh, well, I'm very hmm. well. Yeah, uh, actually, you? no, that's a lie. I'm doing that thing, that very British thing where people say, how are you? And you go, oh, yeah, fine. Feeling, yeah. Feeling actually feeling a bit off colour today. Oh. Um, so, Shame. whereas we would normally say uh, over there, joining uh, you, Richard James, and me, Jamie Anderson, is Chris Dale, and d- he's doing yes. something. I've actually sent Chris off on a little trip to oh, uh, yes. a well-known British pharmacy brand, just oh. to pick me up some extra lem sip. I see. I uh, wondered where he was. And some strepsil. So, Chris, I'm sorry to have done that to you, uh, but he'll oh. definitely be back in time. It's not far to said pharmacy, so did he you, should uh, be back soon. Did you tell him he could keep the change? <laughs> I I did. I did. Ve- good. A very good. generous errand creator, I am. Well, you know so. what he'll get with that. Uh, uh, he'll get a bag of Tang Fastics and a Snickers. Oh, he will, yeah. won't he? Uh, and, yeah. he? and he won't share them with us. Yeah. No, of course he won't. Anyway, so Chris will be back with uh, hopefully Lem Sip, Strepsils, Tangfastics, and Snickers, all of whom will be sponsoring the Jerry Anson podcast in due course, I hope. Yes. Uh, he'll be back in time, <laughs> hopefully, for the end of this podcast to give us his wonderful randomizer where he skips through a fantastic random Jerry Anson series, a random episode of that, and gives us his insightful thoughtful and hilarious comments throughout yeah uh, that's true but other than that there'll be other stuff in this episode which i should say is dedicated to our late great friend the very lovely wonderful and much missed denise Breyer. ah yes yes of course it is and uh, jamie it's nice to see you out of the closet finally <laughs> <laughs> no, i mean i yes. should Maybe well, explain. It was getting rather uncomfortable and sweaty in there. Uh, so, yes, last <laughs> week, uh, Posterons, you may have heard that I had mm-hmm. um, slightly messed up the news and so I had to re record it. But at that particular moment, I was in a hotel in uh, on the glorious English Riviera in Torquay. And to try and deaden the noise of what was going around me, I had to sit in the wardrobe <laughs> uh, to record the news. So, apologies for that. I will try to do better this week. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yes. Well, of course, we do have some Jerry Anderson news coming up a little later on. Thank because goodness. Because this being the Jerry Anderson podcast, yes. we've got some stuff to talk about. You oh, know, have we? To do with Jerry Anderson. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, like we do every week. Uh, we've also got, uh, yes, Chris Dale's randomizer, which we're all looking forward to at the end of the podcast. Oh, yes. We've got uh, part two, I think, of your interview with the lovely Jules de Young. Yes, Jamie. we do Good. indeed. Yes, the, the second and final part. Uh huh. And we'll be hearing from our lovely Podstrons. Now, it's going to be slightly different this week, I think, because uh, we've got lots of wonderful tributes to the lovely uh, Denise Breyer. And we don't want to make it maudlin. She would hate that. Oh, if ever gosh. you met Denise, you'd know that she was all about living life to the full and having fun wherever you possibly could. So but this is not going to be a, a maudlin edition uh, of, the, uh, of the podcast, but we will be stopping every now and then. So our Podstrons and a few other people can uh, just share their memories and uh, share their tributes of uh, the late, great Denise Breyer. Uh, So all that coming up. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Lovely stuff. And even the sad bits will be lovely too. So there we go. Now, uh, you may occasionally hear me slip into a lower octave for a special occasion. Um, Uh, Hello. uh, um, And uh, I'll try not to do it too much during this week's upcoming Fab Fact. Oh. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Now. Time for this week's Fab Facts. Oh, yes. It's Mm. Richard's favourite, Podstron's favourite, well, and certainly my favourite. It's Fab Facts. Be quiet, Richard. Uh, Here I have a book of Fab Facts. I'm going to flick through the book. Richard will shout Fab at a random point, and it is random. When he shouts Fab, I will stop flicking, and hopefully we will chance upon a random Fab Fact. 
Okay. And then I'll read it to you, obviously. That's the, that's the, the game. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, come, hang on. We could do all of that and then just not read it out. Uh, okay, fine. Right, here we go. Let's try that then. Uh, <laughs> here comes the flick. Are you ready with your fab? I'm ready. Off we go. Fab! Oh, fascinating. Us to, to the, the end, end of this week's, week's <laughs> non-fact. <laughs> yeah. that, that would keep everyone happy. Wouldn't uh, it? it would keep some people happy. But no, let's mm. let's stick with the format. Oh, go on then. And actually, I'm going to give you a fab fact. I just dropped my book of fab facts, oh. which then knocked over a pile of books, and oh. there's now a mess in my office. So. With hilarious consequences. No consequences were, were hilarious here. Anyway, look, Richard. Yes. Like many young fans growing up with Anderson shows, you had toys based on them, didn't you? I did, yes. In fact, before we have previously discussed the unfortunate fate of your Dinky Space 1999 eagle. Yes. Which I believe ended up in a bucket that was later used for your sister's vomit and uh, the twain met. (laughs) You're right. You are right, yes. Very, very sad. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. Understandable in that case. But yes, sometimes accidents do happen. Um, Particularly if you're trying to reenact a particular action scene from your favourite Jerry Anderson show. Oh, Those dinky toys and all other brands, in fact, were not really designed to be played with quite as roughly as their screen counterparts were. But Mm -hmm. that didn't stop young fans from trying anyway. I mean, we probably all did, and we probably all have a story or two or three about an incident involving an Anderson toy that was never the same after we tried to recreate that particular crash landing or that Mm. one car chase or whatever it was. I don't remember the episode of Space 1999 where an eagle was washed away (laughs) in a tide of vomit, but... You don't remember that? Oh. Maybe it's just me, Must have been season two. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, once upon a time, however, there was a family where the children grew up with access to slightly more sophisticated toys than the ones that we had. That family being the Meddings family. Oh, right. Because sometimes what used to happen was that Derek Meddings would take a particular craft home for his children to play with. Imagine. Yeah, I think we can all see this charming story is now heading in a bit of a Sid from Toy Story direction. Uh, Yes, we've all heard horror stories over the years about Anderson props and models and even puppets being destroyed by sledgehammers. Chucked into skips, buried in landfill, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we've not heard about original studio models ending up in the back gardens of the uh, in the back garden of the Meddings family home, being blown up with fireworks, or (laughs) rather tragically, in the case of a model UFO, being used as a frisbee till it broke to pieces. Oh, that's criminal. But of course, it wasn't only Anderson-related props that suffered such fates. Derek was working on many of the country's biggest effects films of the day, so it would have also seen uh, Bond stuff going to that garden, oh. uh, Superman stuff, yeah. and so on, uh, that all eventually met their end in that Meddings garden. Now, obviously, Derek wasn't really thinking much beyond bringing cool stuff home for his kids to play with, like any good dad would. Yeah. Uh, and they were just being kids and doing what kids do. Not that we're recommending playing with fireworks in the garden or using (laughs) UFO studio props as frisbees, please. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But uh, just imagine what iconic vehicles might have been broken or blown to pieces in that garden. It just doesn't bear thinking about. Oh, no, it doesn't. But again, at that time, no one was thinking about archiving any of this stuff. And chances are, if they hadn't ended up in the Meddings uh, garden with the Meddings children, they might have ended up in a skip anyway. But even yes. so, if we had a time True. machine and the location of the Meddings family home at that time, what treasures might we have been able to save? Oh, yes. But let's not end things on a sad note when it comes to um, models from the Andiverse. Let's mm-hmm. end with the Derek Meddings of December 1992, who, upon hearing that a local boy was unable to get a Tracy Island playset, saved the boy's Christmas by making him one using the famous Blue Peter worksheet. But what? with a few Derek Medding style additions. Oh, now, that's cool. That's we, brilliant. It is cool, isn't it? We don't yes. know if that, tra- uh, that Derek Medding's built Tracy Islands that exists, but if you are that little boy whose Christmas was saved by Derek Medding's, then to, do please get in touch with us, podcast at jerryanderson.com, unless you blew it up in the back garden, in which case, shame on you. <laughs> Yeah, we hope you have a dreadful Christmas. 
<laughs> no less than wow. that little boy deserves. Yeah, that's incredible. What a story. Uh, yeah, I, can you imagine that? I mean, I've but I I spoke to a, an agent a while ago mm. who happened to be a family friend of Reg Hill, and she mm. remembers go, going to visit Reg's house and there being a load of props and models on the what? dining room table. I don't think Reg would have played with them to such a destructive degree. But yeah. these models were around for a long time. They were there. I, and I then, mean, I'm sure that, yes. Yeah. That's a question you must get asked. Though. Were, were you never given any of this stuff when you were growing up? Did I you had, never take anything home from, did you take rum and tan <laughs> home from Space Precinct? <laughs> to put in your grandmother's chair? I had <laughs> a tweet this morning saying, have you got any of the old puppets or the props? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's an accurate uh, uh, impression of the tweeter, but... Uh, oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, you know, I don't have anything. I mean, uh, I yeah. uh, you, you've mentioned Romex Hands. I have Romex Hands here, but only because uh, our uh, dear, late, great friend Richard Gregory uh, returned them to me. He kept them for all those years. Yeah. I, I, I infamously, uselessly painted one of <laughs> Romex Hands, which was, the, which was the rubbish one, if you see it on screen. Yes, yes. Uh, which I've I've got upstairs now. I bought a few bits and pieces home from Space Precinct um, that I was allowed to, and I did have a Sproggle from Lavender Castle for a while. Oh, did which you? I painted, yeah. Um, but uh, do you know what? I'm sad to say I think I flogged Sproggle on eBay uh, oh. when I was a student for my beer money. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, Gosh. but you regret it now. Well, I do now, yeah. But, um, yeah, of course you, know, you do. Uh, hindsight and all that. Uh, yeah, no, I've yeah. got nothing like significant. Me. I know you've got um, a multicom and your gun. Uh, and a gun. And your and badge. The shirt and a badge. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. a bit. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are collectors out there who've got amazing stuff. <clears throat> yes, I do. I have to say, I don't really play with them that often. I say that I've often because you. I do sometimes I've play seen with them. you doing it. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Oh, maybe. I mean, like, we have just been down in um, the southwest uh, on a, a shoot for the documentary. Yeah. And um, I had a lot of very cool toys around for that. Some really oh, special stuff, including right. Podley, who made a, an appearance. Oh, yeah. Okay. Who's, Lovely. Who's looking very good for his age. You know? <laughs> I mean, he's 30 years old almost. Uh, yeah, plus whatever he was when he started. So, uh, yeah, yeah th- these yes. things do exist in places, but I'm sure many tens, if not hundreds of props, met a rather sad end along the way. Yeah, what a shame. Anyway, let's not uh, dwell on the destruction of props, but uh, think of those that are still out there in various collections all over the world, including the original Puppet Scale Fab One, which is down in New Zealand with Peter Jackson. Mm -hmm. Um, Other collectors all over the place who've got some great stuff and are preserving it, so please do keep preserving it. But if you are that little boy who has the Derek Mennings constructed Tracy Island, email us immediately. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, great. Anyway, I think on that note, on that hopeful note, that brings us to the very end of this week's... Prop fact. There we are. I like that one. Yes, I love the idea of people just getting this stuff and blowing it up in the garden. What do you think the Derek Meddings sort of attachments and amendments were to the Blue Peter Tracy Island? Oh, surely some automations in there. You I'm think, sure. I bet you that uh, Thunderbird Two, um, you know, shuffled uh, down the runway by itself yeah, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, nice. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now, you're listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Please remember that you can subscribe to us or follow us or like us or befriend us on whichever platform <laughs> you're listening to us on. And that means that you'll get notified every time a new episode drops every Monday morning. You can also leave us a nice review and a rating uh, to let the world know what you think of us. And why not copy the link and share it on all your online socials as well so your friends get to listen too. Now, I'm going to this week head straight on over to our Podsterons group. Mm. If you're on Facebook, just head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons, where you will see that the podsterons are meeting in the wild. Mm. Yes, they are. How wonderful is that? Scott Bickleeke and Ross Patterson met with Daniel Coffey. Jenny Davis has met Andrea Boot and Willow. Paul Hyde and his wife, Lady P, had a little get together as well in the last few days. So that's rather nice, isn't it? Yeah, Isabel Saucier posts uh, what a treat in this week's podcast i was already a fan of jules de young already since she's the voice of my all-time favorite new captain scarlet green but i think i love her even more now what a lovely and sunny person thank you for having her as a guest guys absolutely oh, she nice. is she is lovely and yeah, sunny isn't she good. always always positive Absolutely. And also, I asked uh, fellow Podstrons if they wanted to leave their tributes and memories for Denise Breyer, who we lost just over a week ago now. Uh, Steve Carson says, Richard Denise was a lovely, warm person who I wish I had met. 
She will always be remembered as Zelda. I have a related question for Jamie Anderson. In Filmed in Supermarination, Denise mentioned recording in a lovely place and Nicholas Parsons advises her that Slough isn't that nice. My point is that while she and Nicholas may have recorded Four Feather Falls with Denise at Slough, is it possible that because Denise was in far more Anderson productions that there were nicer locations for the voice artists? Thanks, Stephen Carson uh, in Edinburgh. I think they recorded quite a lot of the stuff at Islet Park, which is nice, as you know, Richard. So I I suspect there, I think they also may have travelled up to Birmingham to see John and Jean Taylor. uh, And they had a a studio and actually, again, quite a nice place. So it could have been either of those. But I suspect Denise's main memory is Islet Park, not quite a slough. Um, So, yeah, Denise always actually had pretty good memory for stuff like that. So I'd, I'd trust her there. Yes, uh, Paul Hyde says we've lost a person who goes back a very long time to the worlds of Jerry Anderson from Four Feather Falls to Terror Hawks. I was in total shock when I first heard the news and she'll be sadly missed. Rebecca Andrews, Denise was a talented actor and voice actor with a long association with many Anderson productions whose skills ensured the iconic characters she voiced lived on in popular culture. As a person of a certain age, she'll be forever terrifyingly good as Zelda. Denise will be much missed. And finally for now, Steve Rogers, I never had the opportunity to meet Denise, but every time I hear her interviewed, the warmth of her personality shines through. Her joyful and positive outlook on life was so infectious, you always felt uplifted after listening to her. And of course, what an amazing talent for voices she had. The absolute queen of her profession. What a lovely thought. So uh, many more tributes and memories uh, for Denise coming up a little later on. And also some more comments from our Podstrons about other things, including Halloween. Oh, lovely. Yes, perfect. Well, Mm. thank you all for sharing your lovely memories. Yes, there's there's lots more to come. And I think actually today's podcast, rather than the usual closing theme, I would like to end with a little kind of um, mashup mega mix of uh, words and wisdom from Denise. So uh, if you could listen through all the way to the end, um, you'll hear that today. And I I think it'll maybe leave you a little bit sad, but mostly warm and fuzzy and positive. Perfect. There there you go. Uh, Now, Richard James, would you like to look ahead with some Gerry Anderson news? Oh, yes, please. Then let's do some Gerry Anderson news. It's the Jerry Anderson news 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 news. That's very Earth good. Man. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it actually is. Uh, yeah, great. Sorry about that intro. It's, uh, it's just too tempting to do that. In fact, after this recording, I should be going into my bathroom, shutting the door, and doing repeated uh, Mistron impersonations. Oh, thank goodness for that. Yeah, just well, in case you're quite want. sure where that was leading. Mistron, <clears throat> what else are you going to do? Come on, Richard. Anyway. Well, I, I, don't know. Richard, you're a yes. fan of UFO, aren't you? And you're quite I a am. comic book fan as well. I know you're a, a, a regular reader of John Freeman's Down the Tubes blog. Uh, well, That's you may true. have seen John and I donning our wigs uh, on uh, Monday last week to announce the UFO comic anthology, which is now available uh, to pre order. In fact, they've been flying out the door uh, since launch on Friday and across the weekend. And uh, if you want to grab it, please make sure you do pre-order because uh, I'm pretty sure our first print run is going to sell out. It's volume one of two. All these strips from Countdown, various other sources, full of fantastic uh, articles, all beautifully brought together and researched by Shaki Visconti, who's done an amazing, amazing work. You may know uh, Shaki's fantastic Jerry Anson Comics website, which sadly is no more. But uh, I know many of our posturons will have read that over the years, a fantastic uh-huh. source of information. And there was no one better to bring this together. It's looking absolutely stunning. Great. So uh, look forward to that. Should be arriving in the UK end of November and be with you early December. Uh, so mm-hmm. a great Christmas present to yourself or a loved one or both of you even. Uh, yeah. On a slightly um, uh, less UFO note and more international rescuey note... Right. It's actually an International Rescue Notebook, which I had previewed a while ago on Twitter. It's uh, the International Rescue Field Agents Notebook, top secret, of course. A uh, stylish notebook in which you can keep all of your notes about International Rescue's operations, uh, your shopping list, poems, personal thoughts, doodles, and other things. Uh, like you can it. grab that from the Jerry Anderson store now. Both of the previously mentioned thing that's things there, in fact, from shop.jerryanderson.com. Now, are you going to MCM Birmingham? Because... I think we might be. Oh, 
Oh. It's on the 13th and 14th of November from memory, although I should have probably looked this up before we did the mm. news. Uh, so if I'm wrong, then uh, please amend your memory of what I just said to the correct dates. <laughs> right. We're going to have a couple of tables there, and I hope we might be talking a little bit about um, expanding the Space 1999 universe while we're there at a small live event. Um, okay. More details on that soon, but we do hope to see you there. Uh, we'll also be there to sign things and uh, chat all things Anderson and... Um, tell you about the amazing concert yeah. stand by for action which is uh, uh, yeah, coming yeah. Uh, 16th of april next year at the birmingham symphony hall also known as b music these days and um we're hoping to make some casting announcements about that next week oh. so stand by for action about stand by for action great get it yeah. good uh, last week i was busy uh, up in uh, no not up in down in the southwest of england uh, I'm upside down there uh, yeah. doing some filming for the uh, upcoming documentary Jerry Anderson A Life Uncharted amazing stuff coming to light there it's a real journey into the unknown actually huh. uh, for me we keep learning new stuff we keep understanding him better and better and it's yeah. kind of strangely modifying my view of him yeah. as we go for the better I might add but it'll certainly change your view about how the shows came together where the ideas came from his inspiration for characters and style of storytelling and all that kind of stuff. It's just fascinating. So I can't wait to share that with you. There'll be trailers out in the next month or so. um, So you can start to get a feel for it all. But uh, Richard, you've Mm -hmm. seen the deep fake, haven't you? Yes, Um, I have. It's uh, it's it's, extraordinary. it It is amazing how it's coming together. So very excited to share that with you in due course. If you're a Space 1999 fan and a Lego fan, then uh, do you know of Kid Bricks, Richard? I've not heard of Kit Bricks, no. Kit Bricks is a construction system that bears a resemblance to a well-known construction system, which I may have previously mentioned in a sentence just now, but I don't oh, think you're yeah. supposed to mention them in the same sentence together. Okay. So I believe Kit Bricks is fully compatible with that other system. I see. Uh, and uh, 1612, rather strangely, I think, in a great way, but I just unexpectedly are, are doing some Kit Bricks sets. Right. So you can build some of your favourite vehicles from Space 1999 in this construction block compatible um, product. Okay. They are available for pre-order now and will be delivered around March next year. Now, I should say around March next year because logistics are, oh, goodness me. They are so, so tough right now. Yeah. And I'm sure you may have been the recipient of an email from Tim or Louise or myself saying, you know, I'm really sorry that this this item is delayed. And you're probably thinking, oh, it's been delayed ages. How can they get it so wrong? Well, on, that, that's the same guy that uh, he, he tweeted you earlier it about is, it is, if you had any puppets. Well, strangly enough, it is. Yeah, yeah exactly the same right. person. Yeah. So you may well be thinking, how can they get it so wrong? Well, yeah. it's because the entire world of logistics has been turned upside down. Everything is a complete nightmare. There are delays after delays after delays. And you may not be seeing it as a consumer uh, in the supermarkets quite quite yet but we are expecting some pretty major disruptions we come into christmas and stuff so (sighs) it's pretty universal it's not just us and unfortunately when we are bringing in a couple of thousand units of something from china those couple of thousand units don't really matter in the scheme of things so we're likely to get bumped for some someone who's bringing in a hundred thousand or a million units of something which is happening all the time the bigger manufacturers so we kind of suffer the worst out of everyone which is a real shame so thank you for bearing with us but yeah, it's just the way the world is currently. Um, we do our best, and uh, sometimes there's absolutely nothing we can do. No, true. However, the nice thing with digital stuff is it's not held back by shipping delays, which is why you've been enjoying on a weekly basis Century 21 Tech Talk Series 3. Ah, yes. Did you see that seamless segue there? Well, no, you didn't because <laughs> it was good. seamless. It was. This weekend just gone on Saturday, you had Fire Flash. I can preview uh, to you now that this Saturday you've got Cloud Base, all narrated by John Coleshaw as Jeff Tracy. Really lovely little insights into the tech and treasures of the worlds of of Century 21. A really fun little series, so please do do go and enjoy that. And also you've got two previous series to enjoy if you've never seen it before, so just go on to youtube.com slash TV, search Century 21 Tech Talk, and enjoy. And Richard, unless you've got anything else, I think that probably brings us to the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News? I think that probably brings us to the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. Then that is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. Jerry Anderson News.
That was the news. That was the news. Earth. Oh, man. I mean, much, much better voice than you are, Jamie. Oh, you, you really are. It's it. pathetic, isn't it? I must uh, buck my ideas up. Now, going back to the documentary, A Life Uncharted, uh, mm. there's. Uh, how, how long have you been allocated to grab all the footage that you need for this? How long's the shoot? And... Uh, so we've got one more shooting block, uh, mid late November, and then right. that, that is it. We are done. I we see. have, uh, you know, uh, taken up all of our allotted time. There may yeah. be a couple of last minute interviews if we get the chance, but yeah. Um, yeah. it's mostly voices you won't have heard before, which, which I think is, is really interesting. Fascinating, absolutely, yeah. And you're right, you very kindly sent me a couple of clips of the, of the deepfake. And I have to say, to allay anyone's fears, it, there's nothing morbid or uncanny valley or weird or moribund about it at all. It, it really is, uh, I suppose, bringing these old audio interviews to life yeah. uh, in the most visual sense. It's, yes. it's quite extraordinary. It works wonderfully. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the version that you've seen is not the final version either. There, no, uh, there's no. some more work to be done on it. But I'm, I'm, I'm really chuffed with how it's looking, and it's, um, it's sort of goosebumps time, but not in a spooky yeah. way. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah very exciting. Uh, now, over on our Facebook group, uh, Simon Allen says great fab facts uh, about Jerry Anderson's work on the Return to the Forbidden Planet uh, from a couple of weeks back. He says I'm sure there are a few such jobs that have uh, slipped through the net, like the news that he was going to provide SFX for an all-star version of Aladdin, staged from December 1970 into 71 at the London Palladium with Scylla Black in the title role, a very high budget, and a furry gentleman looking over her shoulder in the picture that he posted. Uh, effects to be included was a spectacular transformation scene. Ah, that's oh. interesting. Did you know about that? I don't Jerry think... Anderson no. venturing into pantomime. I don't think that uh, crossed onto my radar, so... No, no. A fab fact indeed. Yeah, Louise, our, uh, our uh, group um, admin, posted... Uh, it was Halloween this week, and she asked Posterons for their scariest... Jerry Anderson character. Uh, Gary Hodgkinson said, well, it had to be Commander from Space Precinct. Uh, Nick Rice says Captain Black or Moid. Tom Hodden says Space 1999 Dragon's Domain. Lou Dean says those laughing puppets in Thunderbird 6. <laughs> uh, yes, a bit scary. Nadia Eugene says original Captain Black for me. Colin Taylor, Candy and Andy. Lance Harrington, the scariest Jerry Anderson character ever. Jamie Anderson. I knew it. I felt it was coming. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So cruel. So yeah, cruel. Yes. Uh, but sometimes fair. Yes. Uh, and some more tributes for the lovely Denise, of course. Steve Bushell says, sad to hear this news about the elegant Denise, a wonderful lady with a great character enhancing voice. All my best wishes to her family. Mark Perkins, very sad news. Only a couple of days ago, I was laughing at her and Nicholas Parsons when they were interviewed for the film in Super Marionation documentary as they remembered what ended up as the voice casting for Tex Tucker, sending sincere condolences to her family. And Stuart James Lusher says, very sad news. She was a lovely lady. She was brilliant with all her voices throughout her career. And I'm sending my condolences to her family at this sad time. Now, a little earlier on, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to someone who's done quite a bit of work with uh, Denise Breyer, and that's Beth Chalmers. Ah, uh, yes, uh, lovely Actor Beth. and voice actor, yep, uh, who you may well know uh, as Kate Kestrel from the audio Terror Hawks from Big Finish and Anderson Entertainment. And uh, here's a few of her thoughts on working with Denise Breyer. You know how when people get older they become curmudgeonly and close-minded and irascible? Well, that uh, just wasn't Denise Breyer. <laughs> she was so open-minded and open-hearted and kind and just loved being around young people and new people and different people. She, she just drank everything in. She was an incredibly happy woman and I think... That's how I will remember her and how I would like to remember her. Because it's true, she was very, very happy. Well, the Denise I saw. I hope she was always very happy. But, yeah, in the recording studio, she was a very happy, upbeat, bright woman. She was like sunshine in that studio. And she was funny. She was funny. And she was a great laugher. She would laugh at other people's jokes. So she was generous. She was a generous laugher. And she was funny. And she was sunshine in that studio. Yeah. And every time she turned up to um, to the recording, I was would covet her wardrobe. She was nearly 90. And I found myself coveting her wardrobe. She was so elegant. Unbelievably elegant. It just felt like an urchin standing next to her. Um but just so well put together, so elegant. 
And that's, I think, why it was it was a, a, a shock, even though she was over 90. It shouldn't be a shock when somebody dies, really. But it was because she had so much life. So much life because because she was so happy, I think. I hope I live like Denise Breyer. I hope I manage to take that from her and remember that and uh, live as much like her as I can. She'll be very, very missed. Yeah, she was real sunshine. Oh, lovely Beth. Yeah, it wasn't... Yeah, wasn't that lovely? I love the phrase, it's sunshine. She brought sunshine into the booth. That's yeah. really nice. Completely, completely right. Um, yeah, that's how we'll all remember, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, always a, a, a ray of sunshine. Even after, at uh, the end of Series 2, we'd all, all been out boozing. I'm sure I've mentioned this before on the podcast. But uh, <laughs> yes, we all went yes. out. I uh, had a call from um, Denise's daughter-in-law at about 10 o'clock saying, are you, are, you with, are you with Dee? Is she all right? And I said, yes, she's making us have another round of cocktails. And then the next morning, everybody sort of crept into the studio with a bit of a hangover. And then, bang on time, Denise sweeps in. Good morning, darlings. Oh, I feel fabulous today. I've never felt so good in my life. She was, I, I don't know how she did it. And that was, I mean, she, yeah. what was she then, 89? Uh, coming yeah, up for 90? Just, yeah. just incredible. So, yeah, thank yes. you, Beth, for your memories. Great. Absolutely. And uh, I did speak uh, a, a little more length with, with Beth about uh, her life, career and uh, Terra Hawks and uh, Big Finish and boxing. And I think we might be hearing that uh, interview uh, in a few weeks time. I look forward to it. Uh, shall I yeah. also share uh, a message from Robbie Stevens? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Robbie posted just a short and sweet message to say she was the most wonderful Zelda to my young star and just such fun to work with. Always up for a giggle and full of enthusiasm for us youngsters as we were then. A true inspiration and a beautiful person. I shall miss her very much. She is not replaceable. Well, here, here, Robbie. Ah, yeah, lovely, lovely stuff. Gosh, there we are. So yes, uh, I'll be reading out more tributes to uh, the wonderful Denise Breyer a little later on, uh, and heading over to YouTube as well, where people have been uh, posting on our previous podcasts and fab facts. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to those. In the meantime, though, yeah, yeah. do you think we should hand over to another fantastic voice artist yes, please. of the Andiverse? It's yep. uh, Jules de Young, oh, best known yes. to many of you as Lieutenant Green in New Captain Scarlet. Mm. Um, this is the second part of Two with Jules, talking all things voice and Stingray and all that kind of thing, because, of course, she plays Atlanta now in Stingray, oh. and she does an amazing Lois Maxwell. She's so good. Uh, oh. So, OK, over to Jules for part two. Here she goes. Were you aware, as the voice cast, of any of the kind of the difficulties on the production side, uh, things that were tricky early on? I remember that they started down one road with the uh, the software they were using, and then had to change, and it was yeah. radical. It was yeah. radical, a huge expense. You know, needing new skill sets, uh, everyone having to learn from scratch. That was a real big hiccup because I think the first episode, the double, double um, intro episode yeah. was the one where they used the original software. That's it. And then yeah. it was just too expensive. So they had to go to a different method. They look comparable, you know, side yeah. by side. But, but it was the speed of production. I think that was yeah. the, the, or the, the lack of speed. I mean, as far as I understand it, they started production in uh, September of 2004 and they were supposed okay. to deliver the first two episodes by christmas and by christmas time five shots had been delivered yeah and that's and that you know it was the finance was contingent on getting those episodes delivered and so they had to bring ron thornton in and he changed everything and and basically i think saved the show um, yeah and so. and from a i think from a creative perspective looking back at it it doesn't look like it's been compromised you know, no, even no. even with that radical change, but I know yeah. that the team at Pinewood must have uh, the chaos they must have felt. We went over and visited with them, but I think that was towards the end. And your dad mm. was involved. You know, he'd come down, he'd come to sessions, he'd he'd come to Pinewood when we were there. He really made himself quite available mm. and was very approachable. And he loved my character. 
Did he? <laughs> That's what he told me. What did he say, Jules? Can you can you remember the words and the context of this conversation? I remember the words, but I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Is it something you could repeat to me privately when we're not recording? Uh, maybe, maybe. Goodness me! Yes. Well, that that it's sounds a, one of those uh, little gem compliments that I hold in the treasure chest of my heart, and I think <laughs> Jerry Anderson said this of my work. Amazing. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. I, and it re- I look and I'm, forward to I'm hearing that offline. Totally sincere about that. Yeah. 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 And of course, I got to be you know Harmony Angel as well. I wasn't yeah. just. Uh, although, let's say just Lieutenant Green, she was she was good enough to be pretty pretty main main street. Yeah, and I mean, Symphony as well. On on Green, I mean, d- did you have any thoughts or feelings about the 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 gender swap they'd made from the original series? Were you, were you aware that that uh, Green had been a a man in the in the classic Captain Scarlet? I was aware, and I thought it was a smooth transition. I didn't think there was mm. any kind of, I don't think there was anything about the character that required. A certain sex so it was no. easy enough nothing was nothing was eroded yeah and it gave i don't know destiny well just with the title of angel that mm. puts them kind of in this more female arena just yeah. by having that title yeah. so it was nice to have a woman in a role that wasn't as feminine so mm. yeah, I thought that I thought it was a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> of course I did, because yeah, they wouldn't yeah. have cast me if it was a man unless they wanted him to sound like Elvis, because <laughs> <laughs> that is the only man that I do. <laughs> that would have been a very different character. <laughs> it would have been very different, especially yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a continuation of a thing that Dad had been doing since the early '60s with bringing the angels in, in original Captain Scarlet and Lady Penelope and and people of yeah. color into roles and all that oh, sort of stuff. So groundbreaking. I, yeah, and even for the time, we you know it's it's something which I think in the industry we are super aware of now, and people try very carefully to address that that gender balance yeah. issue. But it wasn't so, it wasn't there wasn't a, an external pressure back in two thousand and five. I think that was that was Dad and the team doing it of their own volition, which kind of makes it even even better, even more yeah, positive. Yeah, I think that was I think that's just a root of who he is. Mm. I don't think that he was playing any games or trying to do anything political. He just was, you know, a, a female empowering person. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that he saw limitations in people. And making, the, I mean, I say the, the word angel is, you know, feminine, but just the thought of having them as female fighter pilots. You know, I know a female fighter pilot. She was, I believe, the first one in the RAF. And she's now a minister. <laughs> so she went from fighter pilot to fighting for all of us to fighting for all of us for Jesus. Um, so, <laughs> yay, she's still on a good team. And, you know, it was something that was extraordinarily rare. I mean, she's a little bit mm. older than me, but it wasn't that long ago. So putting the angels in place was decades before women were actually taking real roles like that. Yeah. Very much so. So, well, it's nice to see consistent threads like that through the yeah. shows from the 60s through to the 2005. Yeah. When you actually saw the shows themselves and finally saw the episodes, I mean, in what circumstances did you see them? I mean, I remember a screening yeah. of the episode at the John Barry Theatre at Pinewood, yep. which I came to. And I still had a full head of hair, I remember. <laughs> uh, what, what, you look just what was as the, good. Either oh, Jules, you charmer. You do. You, can you come have again. a very nice head. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you, it's nicely you shaped. Heard it here. There's, there's no... Uh, the listeners you know, can't, can't see it, but no, uh, it's, thank it you. it is very, yeah, smooth and... Thank you, thank yeah, you. Well, this isn't about my, my cranium, uh, Jules. This is about <laughs> you and Captain Scarlet. Um, what, what do you remember the reaction being from, from cast and crew on seeing those early episodes? Oh, it was really exciting. I took, I took my niece with me and my boys and we i mean it was it felt like hollywood <laughs> you know we were all so excited to be seeing it on the big screen of course your dad at the front and mm. we must have seen bits and pieces leading up to it but yeah just watching it in that setting mm. 
it had such an impact. I mean, I, I can yeah. remember it to this day. It really was epic, epic. And we were all so excited because we didn't know about what they were going to do to it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. You know, it, we, you didn't, know, we didn't know it was going to have that slot and we thought it was no. going to be. Well, why, it was so hard to imagine why anyone wouldn't make the most of it. Yeah. Because it was such a it was. It was Dad's absolute intention that it be up against yeah. the Christopher Eccleston Doctor Who, and he was so so disappointed and uh, crushed, really, by by. You no, know, it would make a really good computer game. Oh, amazing! You know, but you know the terrible thing. What? All of the the CG models, all the hard drives were junked. <gasps> all those, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of, oh, of, man. of of man hours just destroyed, which is just so so tragic. Was that just because of storage? Uh, long story, contracts, okay. banks, okay. blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I mean, they, we almost lost the, the, the high definition masters as well in that process. So wow. it's just, it's so terrible how all that hard work can be treated by broadcasters, distributors and, uh, and, and financiers really. Yeah. So yeah. a great shame. That is a anyway, shame. It, it is a lovely piece of work uh, and people still enjoy it now and people are still discovering it now, even all these years later. And I think of all the reboots, actually, that, are, that exist of various shows, it's one that tends to get a very favorable response yeah. from, from fans of the classic show. That, that's one where they can say, I can enjoy both of these, Yeah, which is really unusual. We went to some Fanderson, function, Fanderson events. They mm. had um, conferences and stuff. And we yeah. went to a few of those. And the response was tremendous. Mm. Um, I've never heard a bad thing about it, and and there's plenty of people who, if they have a bad view, will let you know. But oh yes, you know, not not when it comes to the new Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Do you think there are any missed opportunities around Scarlet or things that were not done so well? Anything that you other than the uh, slot, definitely other than the, the slot. Yeah. I mean, I mean, on the production itself, and any kind of missteps or anything you you think that's a shame they didn't try this or that. I don't think so. I I think the cast was rock solid uh, you know hmm. really good really perfect casting yeah you know i wouldn't have <laughs> i'm not talking about myself <laughs> <laughs> i mean the, no, the just, woman who played lieutenant green was incredible yes, yes. no just thinking about the cast because <laughs> usually that will be something you know it's not always easy to tell in a casting what hmm. someone will be in reality and they did a great job because everyone held their own they were able to you know bring the characters to life i don't think there was a single weak link in that the scripts were rock solid just yeah. you know one great story after another and phil phil ford did a great job across the yeah. board on those yeah I, so i didn't all i would say is you know do something else with it it's there it's such a great yeah 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 I know. Well, we keep trying to get it out there, and we've been we've been getting it out there. You know, it is at least available. It would even sit as a radio media. play. Well, uh, <laughs> we, we yeah we we need to we need to have a chat about okay. uh, about that because yeah. I, I I agree. I think there would be some great uh, stuff there, especially with such a strong voice cast. Yeah, but that's for a, a future conversation okay. when you also tell me exactly what Dan said to you about your performance. <laughs> Off um, mic. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> So uh, more recently, yeah, you have been playing Atlanta Shore. Yes. Uh, so when I got in touch with you, did you know anything about Stingray? I did know about Stingray because, of course, once I met your dad, I had to find out about everything that he did because, he, you know, he was a very charismatic man. And I thought, okay, I want to know more. So, yeah, I did kind of dig deep and was aware of of most of his work. You could probably surprise me with something now that I've put, <laughs> laid down that gauntlet. I'm going to test you yeah. now, <gasps> yeah. So I knew about Stingray. I hadn't I hadn't spent much time watching it. I kind of miss, missed that boat. Can I say that? Is that too corny? No, that's great. Perfect line. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, it was just great to, to dig into those characters. And when I saw the scripts, I thought this is going to be really interesting because... Stingray has a kind of, it's not a pastiche, but it definitely has that era about it. And that's kind of some of its charm. Whereas oh, yeah. with Scarlet, I think it was the grittiness was the core mm. that had to be kept. Whereas yes. with Stingray, I, I love that kind of veneer of, 
that little bit of polish. And I thought, this is going to be really interesting. What are they going to yeah. do with this? Are they going to make it full on modern or, oh, I think we'd lose something. But no. Now, was it Ben who did the rewrite or did he do the... Yeah, Ben, ben Page adapted uh, Ice Cap from John Thaden's original novel. Okay, okay. So he so, took his novel and the, his adaptation was really sensitive. You could tell, first of all, that he's a fan. There was, yes. you know, it was obvious because of his sensitivity and the way he sewed together old and new. I think people are going to love it because mm. it still has that kind of ta-da, you know, a little <laughs> bit of this and a little bit of that. But, it, you know, it, it's got the drive and pace you'd expect of something modern. So, yeah, uh, yeah I was really impressed with Ben's work on that. And it was great fun. <laughs> of and course. It, sa- it sounds lovely. I mean... When you're creating a new character like Lieutenant Green, you maybe have some, you've got some direction and all that yeah. kind of thing, uh, but, but you're still making it your own. But where it's a very different case when I come to you and say, right, you're basically Lois Maxwell Mark II. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you then go about finding that voice and recreating it? Well, first by listening to her over and over and over again. <laughs> and because she had that smokiness, that kind of... You know, it's set back a little bit, and and she would, duh, you know, when she'd hold things, she had that element of, you know, kind of leaning on stuff. So it was, it was finding the music of her voice, if that doesn't sound too Phantom of the Opera. No, that's great. <laughs> Spot on. Yeah, so finding that, okay, what is she doing mechanically? What, it, what does it feel like? And kind of getting into her skin. And then yeah. once once it was there, it was it made it obvious. I mean, that's kind of when I develop any character, I try to do that process to a degree of, you know, who are they? I want to know who they are. I want to feel what it feels like to be them. And then once you've got that suit on, it just flows out of it. So it took a little more digging because it was going to be matching someone in particular. But I think once it was, once I felt like I really knew her, then I could freely fly in Atlanta's direction. <laughs> <laughs> and and you did just that. Now, if, if uh, Lieutenant Green's vocal pose, yeah. standing braced and working at a, at a workstation, what's Atlanta's Dare vocal I pose? Dare I tell you? <laughs> oh, I think you probably should. <laughs> okay. She had one hand on her hip. Yes, totally. And her other hand, this is so on PC, was holding a cigarette. No, because that's perfect for that era. Because it, it most is. of the puppets were smoking and drinking anyway, so yes, that was fine. that was just her. She was <clears> there. and you know, So, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely Kids don't, lovely. don't do this at home. <laughs> well, I, don't, I mean, you can pretend to, but don't actually do it. Yeah. But no, because you, you sent through some samples for it, and, uh, and Nick Briggs and I just listened, and we both had that instant reaction of oh yeah she's she's nailed it yeah oh and it was we just well but even when i rang you and i was i'd been listening to atlanta and we were chatting about it i could just hear that you're you were sort of within easy reach of lois maxwell anyway yeah the i think our the tone of our voice Mm. the timbers is in the same kind of place it was just adding those little nuances that she put all over the edge and of course her american accent was soft so there'd be points where you know she would do more of an ah instead of an r and yeah you know little subtleties like that which I thought, okay well, we can get that in that's no problem yeah <laughs> well, I've, I've i've loved hearing it uh jules it's been absolutely brilliant and i've um there's more stingray to come um what, what about the process of recording with the guys because you being directed by sam clemens who's the son of yeah. um yeah. brian clemens so we're you know do, doing yet more of that next generation stuff uh more working with wayne obviously nick briggs as yes. well in there yes. uh and uh and mark silk as mark troy silk. <laughs> yep who can do like a million and one voices and is always making up us laugh always <laughs> well, i'm sure he's, he... he's never mark silk is he he's always someone else and he must be an editor's nightmare. <laughs> I love you, Mark. But, you know, because yeah. he's always got something funny to say that's off mm. script and, yes. you know, willing to try it on. So it was loads of fun having it. And we were all in our own individual settings, mm. which you very COVID friendly. <laughs> but I love the commute. <laughs> <laughs> 
Just a short hop, skip, and a jump. Yes, for you. yes, down the stairs and around yeah. the corner. Nice. So yeah, that that worked out really well, and it, it didn't take long for us to feel like we were in the same room, mm. which which is funny. Yeah, I've I've heard that uh, the atmosphere was quite jovial. It was quite jovial. We we enjoyed ourselves. <laughs> Good. Well, hopefully, very soon you'll be enjoying yourselves once again on the next the next Stingray adventure. Oh, I'd love that. Yes. Uh, Jules, when you're not uh, doing Anderson things, yeah, you're doing a podcast, aren't you? I've got a podcast of my own. What that is, is that so podcast? Sweet of you. Well, that was the podcast that saved the day for me and made me build this studio, which got me through COVID lockdown. Thank you. It's a children's storytelling podcast called Tales and Tea with Nanny B. And it's available nice. on, yeah, she's she's very sweet. It's mostly for, I would say it's for five to nine-year-olds is kind of the core audience. Mm -hmm. And the setup is that Nanny B invites you to her cottage she likes to call Dave. And her neighbor, Jules, comes over with a story. <laughs> ah, Conveniently, Jules, who is also a writer, comes over and tells stories and uses voices and, and what have you. So it's been awesome. great, great fun. I, a, a huge learning curve for me. I mean, I don't know about yeah. you, how much of the techno side you're doing on podcasts, but I had to really like learn how to run a whole studio operation and a podcast show in a matter of pink you know, yeah, that was it's it's, it's quite something. Isn't it, it is <laughs> quite something. There's a lot behind the scenes to do, so that was really tricky. And I thought about monetizing is always weird with these things, isn't it? Because you think mm. it's not straightforward. I'm used to doing a job, getting paid. Doing a job, getting paid. It's a very nice arrangement. <laughs> and then with podcasts, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you, you build up an audience, you you find other ways. And I thought this show was going to be a way for me to connect with little children because mine aren't little anymore and I was pining for little people. So I wanted to have that kind of access to little people doing, you know, workshops, writing workshops with them, creative voice workshops with them, which I have been able to do even over Zoom. So I wanted to to get that link and tie that down. I also wanted to showcase my writing because for years I've been, you know, kind of writing when asked and I have a few of my own things that were going on. But I just, I don't know, you know, when you're really busy, it's quite hard to go, I'm going to stop and I'm going to put in the effort I need to push this forward. So Nanny B was really my way to put my writing out there. And it has been Incredible. I am writing a film right now. I've been commissioned to write with a writing partner. Awesome. A, um, yeah, a children's feature film. I have helped rewrite a children's feature film, and I helped rewrite a book to accompany a children's feature film. So all this out of a little podcast show. So that's how she's bringing home the bacon. And I just say Amazing. thank you, Nanny B. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Nanny B. <laughs> uh, if our if our listeners want to find that, it's at Nanny B, as in N A N N Y B E A dot com. Correct. Is that correct? As if it's Beatrice, but we never give that away. And you can find it, you know, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, anywhere. All good record. <laughs> all good record stores. Yeah. So anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find her. Perfect. Yeah. So that's easy. And if you have little people. She is lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You heard it, Posterons. You've got, got kids. Yeah. Time to go listen yeah. to Nanny B. Uh, Jules, is there anything else that you would, uh, any place you would like our listeners to follow you or find out more about you? I wish I was really good at social media. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that then means that you don't think you are. <laughs> I know that I'm not. I, I have all the components. You know, I, I have the. Facebook page, the Instagram thingamabob, the the Twittered hoo-ha, but I'm just not very good at it. <laughs> well, we always tag you uh, in our tweets. Oh, uh, that Jules, is so, so nice. Thank you, because I am like a you know dead bird on the ground, really, when it comes to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> a bird with no wings, just oh, squawking. Well. <laughs> Some of the coolest birds are flightless. So. <laughs> yeah. Penguin. Yeah, I'm a penguin. My we grandma. Were at, 
Oh, sorry. I said I was. I'm a penguin. My my address, my Twitter address. Yeah. What am I? I don't know. Is it Jules Voice? I should yeah. look. I think you are Jules. Uh, Jules Voice or Jules Voices. Uh, let's have a look. Jules Voices. Oh, I think it was Jules Voices for Twitter because my website is Jules yes. Voice, which I think is is smoother and less clumsy. Uh, look at you. You're so slick. Got Jules you Voices. I had to go for because Jules Voice was taken, and my brother said. It sounds like you're schizophrenic. <laughs> Jules' voice is the voice is in my head. But that's kind but of that's how part I of the am. secret. That that is that is one of the many things we'll talk about off mic. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, we go and talk off mic about secret things. Mm. Uh, I will say, Jules, thank you so much for your time and for your memories of New Scarlet and your it memories has been of my pleasure. Stuff and Stingray. Yeah, awesome. I look forward to our next project. Lovely. Thank you, Jules. Yeah. She, there's something about Jules's voice. There's a lovely kind of ringing clarity to it. Do you know what yes. I mean? There's a, oh, yes. A, a, the, the tone. Cause, Certainly. Uh, yeah, she, she's kept her uh, Americanisms so much so. Yeah. But yeah, just I, I could mean, listen to her talk all day. I'm guessing, Jamie, when you came to recording Stingray and so on, there was just no question that you, you were going to get Jules involved at some point. You didn't have to audition her or anything, I suppose. You just uh, you know what she could do. I, I said to Nick Briggs, uh, because we were talking about casting, and, yeah. and I, we were just chatting about who it could be. And I suddenly, I was listening to the voice clips of Atlanta, and I just thought, hang on, I know, know someone who's got oh. a similar tone of voice to this. Yeah, I sent Jules the the clips, and Nick had worked with Jules before and stuff, and, and knew how brilliant she was. Um, yeah, and she she just came back with a quick audition reel, and right. we were like, okay, sold. You're that's Atlanta. It. Yeah. That's it. Congratulations, okay. you are uh, <laughs> the new version of Lois, Lois Maxwell, and um, she's been great. Wonderful. So, yeah, uh, we've got uh, Stingray Monster from the Deep on the way uh, in the next couple of months. Obviously, Ooh. you can hear her in Stingray Operation Ice Cap, mm -hmm. uh, the CD of which I think is finally arriving due to. Pulp oh. and plastic shortages, would you believe? Uh, which is the reason that's been delayed. That'll be finally okay. arriving at the warehouse very soon. Obviously, you can he hear her in New Captain Scarlet as Lieutenant Green. And uh, also find her online uh, at, uh, at Jules Voices on Twitter, uh, julesvoice.co.uk. And of course, her, her podcast, Tales and Tea with Nanny B. Oh, um, yeah. And that's uh, Nanny B spelt uh, B E A. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can find her at nannyb.com, N-A-N-N-Y-B-E-A.com, -A uh, probably spelt correctly rather than me rambling through it, or yes. just find it wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and even it, there is even a Patreon, Richard, ah. uh, where people can support Jules's efforts. Um, oh, so very good. I think if you've got young yeah. ones around, or just fancy hearing some lovely sort of sweet stories, then it might be for you. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Great. Yeah. Uh, and who do we have coming up? Next week and beyond. Uh, so able to give us uh, next week. We've got a recap of the recent uh, online Space 1999 convention. Oh, uh, yeah. Destination Moonbase Alpha, I think Ooh, it was. Great. And um, we've got comic writer and artist Nick Abadzis mm -hmm. in a few weeks' time. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got Beth Chalmers. Mm -hmm. um, we've got an interview, I think, about a new book with uh, about Joy Laurie, who oh, yeah. dates back into Twizzle days. All sorts of right. stuff. All coming up in wow. the next few weeks. Lovely. Gosh. As they used to say in the old Radio Times advert, I never knew there was so much in it. It's true. Same with the Jerry Anderson podcast, isn't it? Absolutely. There's always something new right here. <laughs> now, over on our uh, YouTube channel, people have been posting beneath uh, pod 176. Uh, Ian Dealey says, what a brilliant Captain Scarlet-themed podcast. First, we have part one of the interview with the wonderful Jules de Young. Then we have an episode of the original Captain Scarlet on the randomizer. Spectrum is green. We uh, win. Nathaniel Perry, yeah, posted, Captain Scarlet is a proper double hit of nostalgia. Growing up with reruns of the original and having a younger sibling who grew up with the reboot, it was a joy to watch both. That's nice, isn't it? O.D. Dillon says, Jamie, please search for the patterns for the Captain Scarlet uniform caps. I'm sure that many of us fans would love to have one like those in the shows. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they still exist. They'll have to be remade. But at, uh, with all the manufacturing problems right now, I think we may yeah. be in for a bit of a wait. Yeah, you might be better off making your own, really. Yes, quite uh, possibly. Yeah, Keith Gooch finally says, another great episode of the Jerry Anderson podcast with all the usual tomfoolery between Richard and Jamie. An interesting fab fact... And oh. the movie Crossplot, which I have on DVD. I enjoyed the first part of the interview with Jules de Young. What an amazing voice she has. And as always, the best part 
of course, was Chris Dale's randomizer review of, of the Captain Scarlet episode Spectrum Strikes Back. Well, we'll let Chris know that just as soon as he gets back from the shops. Keith says he had me in stitches when he pointed out the various weaknesses in the plot lines, especially the African hunting lodge. Great show, chaps. Keep up the good work. Uh, well, thank you, Keith. We, uh, we intend to. Uh, yeah. We do do our best, yes. We uh, do. That's now, true. I don't know if you heard just then, but the door creaked open. I Yes, I did hear that. Chris Dale is peering sheepishly in. Yeah, right. What's he done? And it looks as though he may have just spent his cash on Tangfastics and Snickers. Oh! And no well, where's Lemsip. Your, where's your Lemsip? And oh, no well, that's, that is just typical. Oh, hang on. Isn't it? He's, he's whispering to me something. Hang on. Yes. Like sooty. Yeah. Oh. What? Right. He he wants me to um, sound more Mr. Ronnie for some secret project he's working uh, on, which is why oh, he's I decided see. not to. He's uh, not brought you to the lens. Yeah. Mm, Fair thank you, Chris. Um, <laughs> anyway, well, uh, while Ooh. I go and try and find myself some uh, cold medicine, should we hand over to mm-hmm. Chris, the random yeah. meister? Uh, the Tangfastic Muncher, the Snickers Smuggler, uh, yeah, yes, for yes, this yes. week's episode of The Randomizer. Hello, everyone. So, as you have probably gathered by now, this episode of the Jerry Anson podcast is basically a uh, a tribute slash salute to our dear departed Denise Breyer, who who sadly left us um, about. 10 days ago, I guess, when this is broadcast, maybe nearer two weeks. And um, I, I didn't want to do a, a normal randomizer for, for, this, um, for this week because uh, I, I too have, had a, have been lucky enough to have had a, a connection with, with Denise over the years. Um, many of you will know that I wrote several episodes and, and, and did voices in uh, several of the Big Finish uh, Terrorhawks audios, but my first encounter with Denise was actually it was Terrorhawks related but it was uh, a bit earlier than that it was back in 2003 uh, if you have the the Revelation Films complete DVD box set of Terrorhawks has a, a reunion documentary on there uh, Denise Robbie Stevens Jeremy Hitchin and Anne Riddler were, were reunited for a day and uh, I was present for that which was a wonderful experience, and Denise was was already there when when I got there because it was shot at her daughter's house. So uh, she was she'd arranged for that to be loaned to the production, and instantly Denise was just the most welcoming, friendly, warm person I, I'd probably ever met up to that point. Even though I was someone she'd never met before, it was almost like. She almost seemed to sort of instantly accept me as some kind of old friend. And uh, over the course of the day, she got to revisit not only her her fellow Terrorhawks castmates, but she also got to replay Zelda. We we wrote a, a, a script for the four of them to uh, to gather around the mic and perform all their old uh, characters. This is myself and uh, Stephen the Riviere of uh, Century 21 Films, who are responsible for Thunderbirds 1965 and Nebula 75 and so on. That was It was wonderful to watch this sweet, wonderful old lady just so full of, so full of warmth and and love become this this tyrannical monster that is Zelda uh, and it, she clearly loved doing it and it was it was so wonderful that um, after I suppose yeah at that point it would only have been 20 years since the the show ended in fact we're coming up on 20 years of, of that documentary my goodness uh, but uh, it was all still there Denise was you know she was still able to draw on Zelda and Mary and and she did and she did with great relish after that uh, i also worked with her again she was uh, kind enough to agree to participate in two uh, audio dramas that i wrote while i was studying radio at university there was one that i wrote about a um, a, a woman who's visiting her husband while he's dying in hospital very cheerful stuff for which oddly enough she did reprise zelda during the recording the other one was uh, alan bennett's Cream Cracker Under the Settee. I don't know if there's any uh, Talking Heads fans out there who remember that uh, BBC series, but she did that beautifully. And in fact, I think I still have the the files for those. So let's hear a little bit of Denise Breyer in Alan Bennett's A Cream Cracker Under the Settee. I wanted to call him John. 
The midwife said he wasn't fit to be called anything. And had we any newspaper? Wilfred said, Oh, yes, she saves newspaper. She saves shoeboxes as well. I must have fallen asleep because when I woke up she'd gone. I wanted to see him, wrapping him in newspaper as if he were dirty. He wasn't dirty, little thing. I don't think Wilfred minded, <laughs> a kiddy. It was the same as the allotment or the fretwork, just a craze. He said, we're better off, Doris, just the two of us. It was then he started talking about getting a dog. If it had lived, I might have had grandchildren now. Wouldn't have been in this fix. Daughters are best. They don't migrate. Watching Denise sat behind a microphone doing these things, it made you realise that um, it, it was slightly sad that she hadn't really been been employed that much from sort of the late 80s onwards. And I think you know, people just stopped asking her. So it was wonderful to see her back behind a microphone, back where she was happiest, really getting her teeth into into something powerful and dramatic as as that is and again she was such an incredibly friendly welcoming soul i i get the impression i always had the impression with denise that she remembered me but she wasn't sure where from and maybe she was confusing me with one or two other people but it didn't really matter so there was that familiarity um, on both occasions. This was 2005, 2006. And she was always asking what I was up to. And, and so I think Jamie has probably said she was, you know, Auntie Denise. She felt like your, your grandmother. And that's absolutely, absolutely true. She was like the, I, if you could have like custom built the ideal grandmother, you couldn't have made a better one than Denise. So then in 2014, when it came time to do the Terrorhawks audios with Big Finish, I Again, I had that familiarity with Denise, and even though it had been, oh, seven or eight years since I'd last seen her at that point, she still, again, seemed to seemed to remember me from somewhere. She knew not where, and it didn't really matter, because it was just, oh, darling, I've missed you, and she would just sweep you up for this great big hug, and oh, it was, it was so easy to return that, because it was so genuine. And then watching her, watching her, playing Zelda. I mean, also Mary and, and its star and, and all the other characters to a certain extent, but particularly Zelda, this warm, wonderful, gracious, radiant woman, not only producing this superbly villainous character, but but clearly relishing in what she was doing. And there, there are some moments in those, those Terrorhawks audios, they get quite dark, some of those stories. And she loved it. And it was it was great to see her with with reunited with her boys um lots of uh lots of dirty jokes and uh, unrepeatable stories but um she was never the instigator of those and yet somehow somehow jeremy could be telling some some dirty joke or story or whatever and denise would somehow come in with with a punchline that not only topped jeremy's but it seemed almost effortlessly innocent she was on the wavelength, but she didn't have to lower herself to to that kind of tone. She she kept a sort of innocent aloofness uh, above it all, and uh, yeah, they clearly loved her uh, as as did all of us. So it is obviously ninety three years old is uh, is an incredible age to reach. But I, I look at um, at footage of her, and I, I just think that is what I would would like to be if I live to to be to be old. Um, someone who, no matter what their physical age, they seem young at heart and young in spirit. And that was Denise. She had this this childlike wonder of, of the world around her and, and the people she was interacting with. She always saw the, the bright side in everything. I don't remember her ever being upset or, or cross with anybody. Admittedly, I... I only knew her through those um, those sort of professional interactions. I never like went out for lunch with her or anything, but she was very much 
what you saw was what you get. And if you've seen any of those behind the scenes uh, of the Terrorhawks Audios videos on uh, YouTube, what you're seeing there is exactly the person that she was. So not only a superb talent as a voice artist, I mean, not not just for for Zelda, but for, for everything she turned her hand to, but also one of the nicest, sweetest, most gracious human beings I have ever had the joy to um to come across in in this world so yeah I, I count myself as as truly blessed to have known and worked with Denise as often as I did and knowing her will forever remain one of the best things that's that's ever happened to me I think so, moving on to this week's episode of The Randomizer, if anyone's still listening to this at this point. Appropriately enough, and this wasn't planned, this is just how it went, uh, the episode that you would have heard today was a Four Feather Falls one. It was recorded uh, several weeks ago, and I thought, oh, okay, this would be a, a, you know, a nice tribute to Denise. Here's a Four Feather Falls episode. And then I was reviewing it, and I realised, ah, she's not in that one. So, for the first time... I'm not exactly breaking the rules of the randomizer, but I am bending them a little. The episode that was recorded, and you would have heard today, uh, that's postponed to somewhere later down the line, probably before the end of the year. Instead, we are going to pull up an episode of Four Feather Falls, still Four Feather Falls, that hopefully she had more of a presence in. As my tribute to Denise Breyer, I hope I could say my, my friend and colleague... And if not, just one of the best people I ever w- was lucky enough to to stand in a room with on on more than one occasion. Here's Four Feather Falls, the Mar Jones story, and thank you, Denise. The four feathers on this hat are magic. They enable Tex Tucker's dog and horse to speak, and his guns to fire without him even touching them. And now, another exciting adventure from Four Feather Falls. So, welcome back to Four Feather Falls. As I said, not the episode you would have had today, but it's still a Four Feather Falls, so uh, that's okay. It gives us a bit more of Denise. And uh, if you're interested, this episode... This episode was originally going to be on pod... 430 something this has been pulled forward from so uh yeah it would have been a long time before this this turned up naturally but i think it's appropriate enough to uh to do that today and not not show a, a terror hawks episode as such because we've not long had terror hawks let's give four feather falls a a, a chance to uh, to shine now giddy up rocky i just hope that denise is in it because uh Despite the title, that might not mean anything. I'm breaking in my new shoe. She might not be there. His big feet, Jax. Reggie's trouble. He ought to be like me. Dandy feet dusty. Aww. When you are dandy feet dusty, anyway, we're riding back into town. Strangers who came to town on the coach. Ooh, strangers. That's what I'm aiming to find out. Oh. Morning, Jim. Jim's playing the piano. Something I can do for you. Yeah. Of course, that's the piano we saw at uh, Andacon 2015. It still exists to this day. I them, except their names, Brad Martin and Jeff Ward. Ooh. Something wrong? No, no, no. No, no, no. Just no. checking. Seems that Jeff Ward says, stay in a while. He brought a big trunk and two bags. Took them straight up to his room. Okay. Mm. Thanks, Jim. Luggage? For people who are staying in a hotel? This sounds suspicious. Oh, my goodness. Here, Jeff. From now on, we don't know each other, okay? Okay, Brad. And drop the brand. Okay, Mr. Martin. They've brought uh, a lot of stuff with them. What's this? My own store from the old gals. <gasps> yep. No! You know what to do? I sell her all them things I brought. And then you tell her that she'll only have to pay one dollar a week for them. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> scam. Pay for them. Then I come in as your boss and tell her everything's got to be paid up. The mm. poor old gal won't be able to pay up. So, we take a store. That'll make us uh, six stores from Dallas to Four Feather Falls. Ooh, managing six stores between the two of you. That's quite impressive. So, that's our evil plan set up. Let's see how they uh, they enact this one. Yeah, Mar Jones' store is looking a bit, uh, a bit low on stuff. Martha Jones. 
There you are, young man. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, there she now, is. This paper you just signed says all these things are yours. I don't rightly believe it. Oh, dear. All these lovely things. We haven't really got a good look at all these uh, lovely things yet. There's a clock. There's um, don't tell nobody. You suck. A few pots and pans. Mostly, it all seems to be in boxes still. It's a secret. No, it ain't that. But uh, folks get jealous. Oh, oh dear! I, I promise I won't breathe a word. That's fine. Then I'll see you next week. So, is this stuff she's allowed to sell in the shop? Oh, a cuddly dog. Uh, or it could be a coyote or some kind of uh, fox-like creature. Yep, she's put it all in the store window. Lots of, uh, oh my goodness, some uh, lovely jars and uh, ceramics, china things and so on. They've, uh, yeah, these guys have really brought everything with them. Oh. Hiya, Ma! Whoa. Why? You scared me. <laughs> Not intended, ma'am. Now, how's things gone this last week? Can't rightly say. Oh, folks are saying the things is too pricey. Well, yeah, uh, they all look very nice. I'll just trouble you for your weekly dollar. Well, uh, all right. Well, well, well. Oh, here it comes. The other guys walked in. Hi, you be? My name's Martin, ma'am. I'm this young man's boss. Glad to know oh. you, Mr. Martin. Well, <laughs> I see you've got a mighty lot of our things, ma'am. Bought them last week for Mr. Ward. Uh, she's paying for them a dollar a week, Mr. Martin. Oh, well, I'm afraid my company cannot accept the uh, dollar a week payment any longer. Oh, no. Obvious scam is obvious scam. Ma'am, cash on the nail. But oh, dear. I ain't got that kind of money. Where's the paper she signed, Mr. Ward? Oh, oh what are you getting at? Here's another thing we could do seeing in HD. This soundtrack is very crackly on this. Yes, it's legal. Yeah. Yes, here we are. It says here. If at any time I, Martha Jones, can't pay for the goods, I will give my store to Mr. Brad Martin, lock, stock, and barrel. Oh, dear. Listen, Mr. Martin. If I took that paper to the sheriff... You listen to me, old lady. This store is mine. And if you want to keep healthy, you won't breathe a word. Oh, no, we're threatening Marjo. We're threatening old ladies. Again, this is Four for the Fools being quite dark. Mr. Ward, can't you do nothing? Sorry, ma'am. I, I can't do a thing. Martha oh, Jones, dear. you're getting out of town tomorrow morning, see? Oh, dear. Oh. Oh. Must be serious, he said, see? Oh. You'd best do like he says, ma'am. See? Get out of town. Oh. And that scene actually showcased um, how well the, the development of the Four Feather Falls uh, guest puppets had come along since the, the very early days of the show. Because if you look at Martha Jones as a puppet and compare her to those two, they are far superior to her. I think there are certain characters on this show that look really good, and then there are others where the design just wasn't quite right to begin with, but they're stuck with it for the rest of the series. See, so you're getting out on time, ma'am. Oh. Huh? What's going on? Pleasant. Twink looks like he's just got out of bed. He's blinking quite furiously there. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah what's going on? They've driven Martha Jones out of town. Where the new owners? Like it says. No owners? Well, I gotta find the sheriff quick. <laughs> According to Twink, it seems these two, Martin and Ward, claim they're the new owners of Mar Jones store. Yeah, that's what they said. Well, there's your answer, Mr. Tucker. They've sure been quick. Sure have. Hmm. Hmm. Well, <laughs> seems like Martin and Ward are suspected of getting other folks' stores with threats. Oh, of course they would be. Crooked land deals in Dallas and Texas. I mean, we already knew they were up to no good, so there was no real uh, mystery there, but... Uh... Well, this time I'm going to smash that record. Yeah, and then I'll smash their faces. Oh, Ward! they put up new owner's signs and they're painting yeah. the shop front. Hand over that paper that Ma Jones signed, making you the new owners of this store. We ain't handing over that paper to nobody. I said hand it over. Now see here, Sheriff. That paper belongs to us. Martin... I'll give you one more chance to hand over that paper. One more step, Mr. Tucker. Oh, he's produced a gun. Yeah. From somewhere. Sheriff, I'll shoot you down. Now, come and get it. Uh, but of course, Tex has magic guns. <gasps> oh, there goes the paper. Catch it, someone. Someone catch it. Someone. Ah, oh, there he is. Twink has saved the day, caught it in his hat. 
I'm going after Maud Jones. Yeah. She could be in real danger out there in the desert. Yeah, oh I did go on. Twink's got a shotgun. Again, Twink is another one of the, the Four for the Fours puppets that looks a bit rough, but uh, I kind of like the, uh, the the simian look of the puppet. I think I've said before, he reminds me of Cranky Kong from the, the Donkey Kong Country games. Meanwhile, out in the desert, there's a cactus that's shaped like Mickey Mouse, and there's Mar Jones and her derpy-looking horse. This stuck in the middle of nowhere. Then he'd arrest the spell. Maybe have a bite to eat. Never slept alone in the desert before. Oh. Guess it could get a bit scary come night. <laughs> Ooh. Now, don't you go getting scared. It's not a good idea to give these horses a close-up. Aside from Rocky, they don't look good. Oh, and speaking of scary things... Oh! Oh, Rocky. Whoa. Some kind of, uh... Animal? That was a quite that was quite a good looking puppet actually. Nothing wrong with my nose, boss. A Mar Jones horse just ain't been this way. Okay then, we'll strike north. Oh, it's a wild cat, I think that uh, that animal. Now, you eat up them oats while I get myself a bite. Oh, good old Mar. She's looking after her horse before she looks after herself. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yes, it's night time. The, the wild cat has relocated to the trees, and they've given it the hood's light-up eyes. Since I came west on the wagon train. War, 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 Rocky, war. Poor Ma. Rocky, yeah, that was quite sinister, seeing that thing. <laughs> just seeing the silhouette in the tree, and then the eyes just turned on suddenly. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> the horse has picked it up. Again, oh, there's a shot of the moon up there. Makes you so jumpy. Ooh, very sinister wildcat. Not doing anything, but very sinister. Stay where you are, Ma. That's it, scared him away. He looked a bit like, um, Buxton the cat from the Magic Roundabout. Never seen a mountain cat that close before. Ooh, you nearly didn't see it at all. Something wrong with your new shoes, Rocky? No. No, it's not my shoes. Ooh. It's my poor hooves. They're oh. killing me. Oh. Well, that's what comes of having new shoes on a day like this. Yes, and it's such a long way back to town. Yeah, but it's all in a good cause. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. You can travel around. We've saved Mar Jones. Um, presumably all the legal stuff back in Four Feather Falls is going to be taken care of. Tex is going to sit beside her and sing while we ride her back to town. Gals and frills and lasers. Presumably Dusty and Rocky will just trot along behind. My hometown. Well, there's a little old street where... Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I was about to say this is charming, and it is, but the, the, first, the first thing that happened in that shot was Mar Jones's derpy-looking horse kind of <laughs> plodded into shot, and... Uh, oh, it looks quite funny. Oh! Rocky and Dusty are, are, are getting a ride in the back of the wagon. The cocks are crowing in the morning. That's nice. And the bluebird starts to sing. This is a nice way to end the story, actually. It's, you know, we don't really have a, a song that's sort of hooray for Mar Jones, so we can, <laughs> we can, we can use this one. Sorry, we're we're now back in town, and uh, Twink has just seen Mar, and he just leapt. Love those gentle. He jumped for joy, and he's so obviously a puppet. It's such a puppety way to, to make that movement happen, but um, he's put her shop sign back up. He's now waiting in the shop for her, holding up a sign, Welcome Home, Martha. Well, what a lovely note to end the episode on. And, you know, as a Four Feather Falls episode goes, that's that's thoroughly, uh, you know, a thoroughly decent average okay episode as, as they all tend to be so um slightly disappointed there wasn't more for denise there to do but uh it's it's rare i think for this show to really focus on any of her characters so it's nice that they did something with mar jones because she's a nice old lady as indeed was denise herself and uh all of us who knew her are gonna always remember her and uh, everyone who saw her work on these shows will always enjoy them Oh, oh, lovely. Well, if you're going to break the rules, yeah. then break the rules for Denise Breyer. That's what Absolutely. I say. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like that. That's, yeah. uh, that's completely understandable. Really so for one lovely. week only, it wasn't that random. No, but uh, yeah, justified lack of randomness in the randomizer. Yeah. yeah, but I like the fact he didn't go for the obvious. He didn't go for Terror Hawks. No, the Marge so nice. story. It's kind of lovely. I mean, like, Denise always used to say that her specialities were playing little boys and little girls and old ladies. Uh-huh. And she just <laughs> loved to slip into this kind of old, old gin-soaked granny voice. Because she really wasn't like that. And she would do no, this kind of whist- no. whistly mouthed, lisping old, raspy granny who loved a couple of gins at yeah. lunchtime. Which was, in fact, the yeah. only thing that uh, Denise had in common with that character. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, lovely to hear and, and great to hear something from the beginning. Because uh, her association with all things Anderson oh, was very, cracking. very long indeed. Absolutely. Died in the wool. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. More responses over on our Facebook group. Uh, Terry Adlam. A uh, friend of the podcast, of course, says a lovely lady with a smile for everyone and a zest for life that belied her age. Callum Parkin says the Andiverse will be a sadder place without Auntie Zelda. We'll miss you, Denise. Neil Holloway, such sad news. We'll all miss the great voices of Denise Breyer. Mm. Peter Dernan says we're running out of Anderson greats. Alex Pass, lovely lady. I had the pleasure of meeting her a few years ago, and I'm very pleased to say that she was every bit as happy, bubbly, and delightful as Zelda was mad, bad, and demented. <laughs> An amazing personality and a sad loss. Uh, and finally for now, Hannah says, This is such sad news. Ever since I heard her from the Jerry Anderson podcast, I hoped to maybe meet her. She sounded such a sweet lady and very talented too. I was also impressed how she was happy to return to Terrorhawks for the audios. I've never seen Terrorhawks, but I think she enjoyed doing what she did. Rest in peace, Denise. Yeah, that's a real mark of the woman, isn't it? That she was more than happy to reprise Zelda. Well, she took a little bit of convincing in the early days. Oh, really? Um, oh, I'm not sure I can, darling. I mean, oh. uh, I I am a terribly wicked old woman, you know, these days. And I do love being evil, she said. So well, maybe oh. I'll give it a go. And then yeah. she just slipped into it and just totally, totally loved it. And, you know, in la- her late 80s, playing yes. a, an ancient space witch... And at the yeah. same time, playing Mary Falconer, who, you know, really was supposed to be in her 20s, perhaps, late 20s. Yeah. So yeah. doing those two voices side by side, just amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. She was, yeah. She was always brilliant. Uh, and also, any possible new voice she could try, she'd be in there. <laughs> I certainly remember a particular script which called for a cat. And uh, ah. I, I, and I just said, oh, you know, well, let's take the cat as red. We'll, we'll do it in, uh, in sound design. And she said, well, no, yeah. I'll be the cat. I'd like to be the cat. Oh. Can I be the cat? <laughs> and then did these amazing things. And she played a dog in Terrorhawks and all sorts of things. Just absolutely brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. And we must, of course, remember her career beyond Anderson as well. Mark Simpson Wedge on, on Twitter posted, yes. Rest in peace, Denise. I was lucky to meet her at the 2014 Andercon. And as well as the voice of Zelda, she did many other voice work uh, for films and TV shows like Starfleet, Return to Oz and Labyrinth. Yes, yes. I mean, all you have to do is just head on over to her uh, IMDb profile, and there's uh, a plethora uh, of credits to her name. Yeah. What a career. Yeah, because, of course, I used to watch Return to Oz on VHS on repeat oh. when I was a kid, and she was Belina yeah. the Chicken, and I had no idea. <laughs> and then when I found out, of course, then she couldn't help but do endless Belina, Belina the Chicken oh, uh, clucks and uh, lines. Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh. Great. Amazing. So thank you thank you to all of you for posting your lovely comments yeah. and messages and we'll make sure they get passed on to uh, Louise's family who uh, obviously are in our thoughts at this time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Richard James, is there any more you would like to add to this podcast? I think that's enough for now. Absolutely, I agree. I think we've done our part. Uh, I need to go and find some Lemsip. If you've got you any do. comments about anything we've talked about today or have any questions or thoughts, email us podcast at jerryanderson.com. Do also leave us some uh, reviews and ratings because we oh, do yes please we do so love those oh we do and yes. make sure you're subscribed wherever and do share this podcast with a friend yes it might, yes. It might make their day it might uh possibly we can't it guarantee that it, it, but, yeah, yeah okay well let's yeah. see how it goes either way either way please do share now to play us out we've got a couple of minutes here of uh some words and wisdom from denise some stuff about her career working on all things anderson her view of life and how to make the most of it and how to stay happy do stick with it and I hope you enjoy uh, because they are brilliant words from a fine lady. Stage one complete. Let's go. Um, 
My name is Denise Breyer, and the person who has influenced my career so much was Jerry Anderson. His son has also influenced me and is still continuing to influence me in doing the work I really love, which is character work. And also drinking gin at lunchtime. Yes, I <laughs> like a nice gin. I'm a very old actress who's come back to play even older, 165 or 45, which called Zelda. Actually, she's queen of the universe. I live for the moment and uh, forget the past and uh, look forward to the future. But really, I've always been living just for this moment. And I think that's why I enjoy life so much. Yeah, and why you're such a force of nature, <laughs> even now. I sometimes think my 90th year is the happiest I've ever had because I'm seeing grandchildren grown up waiting for my great grandchild, hoping I'll have one soon. Amazing. And uh, I don't know, life gets better and better because you become more tolerant and you see people's point of view in a different way. You see them and you understand why they are, who they are, and you just love a lot more. It's but amazing. I uh, I just love being other people, I suppose. I now, at last, quite like being me. But it's taken a long time. Oh, I've had a wonderful life with your father and now you. Oh, bless you. You made a great difference to my life, both oh. of you. Well, I'm going to say that I love you all in spite of my hatred for everything else. I've had a wonderful time and I love you. Hawks, stay on this channel. This is an emergency. <laughs> you have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.